The question of whether the territories occupied by modern Poland were predominantly Germanic or Slavic during the Iron Age was of significance to both Polish and German nationalists, particularly during the 19th and 20th centuries, in order to justify whether they should belong to one or the other state. What people on both sides got wrong, however, is that neither Poles nor Germans existed during the Iron Age, at least not in the way those terms are understood today. Yes, there were Germanic and Slavic-speaking groups living in Europe during that time, but none of them can simply be equated with modern Germans or Poles. Both of these nations and their inhabitants have been influenced by Germanic and Slavic-speaking groups in recorded history. So to determine who has the right to which territories by trying to identify whether the inhabitants of Iron Age Poland were Germanic or Slavic is pointless. What the investigation of this question can show us instead is how Eastern Central Europe developed culturally and how different cultures interacted with each other in the past to help us understand how modern cultures do the same. In that sense, this video should not be seen as a political statement, but as a contribution to the understanding of the cultural history of the region. In this video, I will be taking a look at the study The Genetic History of East Central Europe in the First Millennium CE, by Stollerek et al, published in 2023 in the journal Genome Biology. I will supplement the information provided in the study with the appropriate historical and archaeological framework as well. All sources can be found in the post description. If you're interested in the genetic or cultural history of other regions of Europe, make sure to subscribe to the channel. I've already covered Ireland, Britain, West Central Europe and Scandinavia, and plan to cover other regions as well, which is not to say that I won't return to the aforementioned regions again. On the contrary, there's so much to discuss and to learn about them, especially with the number of archaeogenetic publications ever increasing. But back to the inquiry at hand. The team conducting the study under investigation was comprised of experts from the fields of genetics, archaeology and history. Cross-disciplinary teams are always great to see in studies like these, as that enables the authors to compare the findings of the individual disciplines to each other and possibly connect them. The team set out to investigate whether they could determine if the population of Poland prior to the 6th century AD was Slavic or Germanic by examining the genetic profile of individuals before and after that time period and comparing said profile to ancient and modern Germanic and Slavic speaking populations. Whilst there is some overlap between these groups, particularly in some West Slavic and East German and Austrian groups due to millennia of coexistence, Germanic-speaking groups typically cluster more closely with other Western and Northwestern European populations, especially the Celtic-speaking inhabitants of the British Isles, but also with Northern Roman-speaking groups, i.e. the Northern French and the Walloons of Belgium, where Slavic-speaking groups form a cline, with genetic affinity to Western groups typically declining with geographic distance with the exception of modern Poles, who appear genetically more closely related to modern Russians and Ukrainians. But even the westernmost Slavic-speaking groups typically don't display much genetic overlap with modern Northwestern Europeans. So if the Iron Age inhabitants of modern Poland cluster more closely with Northwestern European groups and not with modern Slavic-speaking or other Eastern European groups, this might be interpreted as them having been linguistically and culturally Germanic as well. As you might have noticed from my wording, this wouldn't be definitive proof, however. Some Slavic-speaking groups, such as the Czechs, appear genetically closer to Austrians than to other Slavic-speaking groups. Similarly, some Germanic-speaking groups, such as the English, aren't too far off the Scots and the Irish. That means that genetics by itself can't tell us much about an individual's or a group's linguistic, cultural and ethnic identity. That is why I will try and place the results of this study in their historical context in the following. But let's dive a little deeper into the study itself first. One issue the study exhibits is that they only examined individuals from the Iron Age Wielbach culture, when Poland during the Iron Age was made up of a multitude of cultures. The Wielbach culture only occupied the northern part of modern Poland, whilst the south was occupied by the so-called Przeworsk culture, which was probably the most widespread culture of Iron Age East Central Europe. An examination of individuals belonging to this culture would have been desirable to give an actual overview of the Iron Age population of the entire region, and not just the northern parts, but the researchers mentioned that obtaining samples from the Przeworsk culture was difficult due to the prevalence of cremation among them. In this context, it should be stated that the Wielbach culture also cremated some of their dead and only those inhumed were suitable for genetic analysis. So the results of the study at hand might not be representative of the entire Wielbach society, which has to be kept in mind. 
When the researchers analyzed the DNA of these individuals, they found that they showed, quote, close genetic affinities between the Iron Age wheelbuck culture associated individuals and contemporary to them and older northern European populations. Further, we observed that the Iron Age individuals had genetic components which were indispensable to model the Middle Ages population, end quote. According to our contemporary sources, most importantly Caesar, Strabo, Tacitus and Pliny, Northern and Central Europe, including the territories of modern Poland, were mostly inhabited by Germanic-speaking groups, which means individuals of the Wielbach culture were probably Germanic-speaking as well. Due to the affinity of Wielbach individuals to Northern Europeans, the study authors concluded, quote, that the Wielbach culture-associated Iron Age population was formed by immigrants from the north, who entered the region of contemporary Poland most likely at the beginning of the first millennium CE, and mixed with the Artoctons." End quote. It should be noted, however, that the neighboring Przeworsk and Jastow cultures, who are also typically associated with Germanic-speaking groups, had been present in the region from the 3rd and the 5th century BC respectively. Unfortunately, to my knowledge, no studies have been able to examine substantial numbers of Przeworsk or Jastow individuals yet, due to the prevalence of cremation among these cultures. But, due to the cultural and linguistic affinity with southern Scandinavia, it is possible that members or carriers of these cultures displayed a similar genetic profile to southern Scandinavians. Hence, it can't be ruled out that these immigrants came to northern Poland from one of these cultures instead of southern Scandinavia directly. Regardless of where they originated, the researchers found that they were mostly males and that their mitochondrial DNA, that is, the DNA that is passed down from mother to child, was, quote, most similar to the Iron Age Southern Scandinavians, end quote. And it mixed with the local females who, according to the study's authors, quote, were associated most closely with the Middle Neolithic groups from Central Europe, end quote, again in regards to their mitochondrial DNA. Again, caution is advised here, as mitochondrial or mtDNA is only a small fraction of a person's genetic profile, so conclusions based on mtDNA alone are usually insufficient. Interestingly, the researchers found that although the Iron Age population of Poland showed greater genetic affinity to other ancient northern European populations, the medieval inhabitants of Poland, although genetically distinct, carried some of their admixture within them. This implies that the original Iron Age population wasn't displaced entirely by later groups. The reason for the relatively small degree of admixture is probably the gradual abandonment of the region by its former inhabitants during the migration period. Both our textual and the archaeological sources indicate that from the 3rd century AD, the Germanic tribes in East Central Europe largely left their homes. Why they did this, and exactly how, isn't entirely clear yet, but genetic studies such as this one might help shed some light on these proceedings in the future. On the PCA plot I've shown previously, the Iron Age and medieval samples are displayed neighboring each other, although still forming distinct clusters without much overlap. Whilst the Iron Age samples seem to resemble Western and some Northwestern Europeans more closely, medieval Poles seem to resemble Austrians and Germans more closely than modern Poles, who appear most similar to Ukrainians and Russians. This would suggest that the population of Poland changed significantly from a genetic perspective not only between the Iron Age and the Middle Ages, but also between the Middle Ages and today. Although the researchers did not specify what led to these later developments, as the study was focused on the first millennium CE. I'm not aware of a study investigating why or how these changes happened, but it is tempting to see them in the context of the German Ostsiedlung, the movement of German and Dutch settlers into East Central Europe during the High Middle Ages. At this point, this is pure speculation though. A second, more detailed PCA plot by the study's authors shows a greater degree of overlap between the Iron Age and the medieval groups, although the former still clearly trends towards Northern and Northwestern Europeans, whilst the latter trends towards Eastern Europeans. Still, a substantial number of the medieval samples appear indistinguishable from Northwestern and Northern Europeans, again suggesting that modern Poles differ substantially from at least some of their medieval counterparts. The differences between the Iron Age and the medieval inhabitants of Poland were also apparent in the distribution of Y-DNA haplogroups, as this statistic by the study's authors shows. According to them, quote, the I1 slash I1A frequency decreased from 41.3% in the Iron Age to 3.5% in the Middle Ages, 
whereas the R1A frequency increased from 8.6% in the Iron Age to 57.5% in the Middle Ages." End quote. In my view, this implies that a large proportion of the male population of the Iron Age was replaced by males carrying R1A. The mtDNA haplogroups, although also experiencing some change, seem to have remained fairly similar between the Iron Age and the Middle Ages in comparison. This suggests that the Iron Age ancestry that medieval Poles carried may have been passed down primarily by females. In conclusion, the Iron Age inhabitants appear most closely related to Northwestern Europeans, although they were genetically distinct from contemporary groups in the region. The study's authors concluded that because of the observed continuity between parts of the Iron Age population and the medieval population, quote, that the migration from East in the 6th CE was not necessary to form the genetic pool of the MA group. However, based on these data, one cannot exclude additional migrations from the Eastern Europe either during the migration period or later, end quote. And I don't know why there are grammatical mistakes in this part of the study. The rest of the study was fine, but there's just uh, some weirdness going on here. Anyway, now I'm not a geneticist and I know that genetic drift is a thing, that is, populations gradually changing their autosomal admixture over centuries, even without the influx of additional genes, as has been observed in medieval Iceland. But the replacement of large proportions of Y-DNA haplogroups in a certain geographic region by another haplogroup, which was previously rare in that region, strongly suggests to me that the local male population was at least partially replaced by newcomers, as has been observed and interpreted in this way in Bronze Age Britain, and that would also be my conclusion in this case, especially because it aligns with the historical and archaeological data. It would also explain why the inhabitants of Iron Age Poland appear autosomally distinct from the medieval and their modern counterparts. That is not to say that there was no genetic continuity at all. As I pointed out, mtDNA haplogroups seem to have hardly changed at all. So whilst many of the Iron Age males seem to have been replaced, at least some of the females weren't. This would explain why a relatively large proportion of the medieval inhabitants of Poland were still fairly similar to Western and Northwestern European populations. What is really interesting, however, is that modern Poles appear genetically very distinct from both their medieval and their Iron Age counterparts. The distinct genetic component identified first in the Iron Age group and then passed on to the medieval population is still present in modern Poles, so the medieval population of Poland must have contributed to the genetic admixture of modern Poles as well. But clearly, other events between the Middle Ages and today impacted the genetic profile of the Polish population significantly, making them more similar to other Eastern Europeans in the process. But what are your thoughts on this study and on my conclusions? Again, I'm not a geneticist, my academic background is in history and to some degree in archaeology, but these investigations offer a new approach to these old questions. Let me know what you think in the comments below. More study showcases like this are sure to come in the future, so make sure to subscribe to the channel if that's of interest to you. In the meantime, as I said before, feel free to check out my videos on the genetic makeup of Britain and Ireland or Scandinavia or both if you're feeling especially generous. But that's going to be it for this one. Thank you so much for watching and I'm looking forward to seeing you in the next one. Until then, have a good one.